across campus, online, and on 12:51 a.m. This, this, this is your student radio station. So again, thank thank you, everybody. We'll we'll start with some introductions. If I could ask colleagues from from the board to start, please. My name is Nicole. I'm a third year history student and one half of the Bourne News Editors. Uh, my name is Oliver. I'm a third year history and politics student and the other half of the Bourne News Editors. Thank you. And from Raw? Um, my name is Lucy and I am one of the co-station managers at Raw this year and I'm a third year politics and international studies student. Uh, my name's Enoch. I'm, a, I'm the head of news here at Raw. And I'm a history and politics second year student. Thank you. And then uh, obviously Stuart, and then we'll we'll get into it. Uh, so Stuart Croft, um, Vice Chancellor, and um, as I said before, uh, looking forward to your questions. Okay. So without further ado, shall we um, shall we start? And let let's start with a question a question from the board. So the first question we have today is: Given the recent shame on you Warwick protests emerging from the university's failure to support a student who was raped on campus. How can students be sure that Warwick's attitude towards rape and sexual harassment has really improved since the group chat scandal? So um, obviously these are really uh, difficult and important issues. And I think what I'd wanna start by saying is, um, we know we're all on a journey here. Uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of work still ahead of us. But there is a lot of work that's been done so far and there's a lot of work that's been done by Warwick as a community and there's a lot of work that's been done by students involved in that. Um, you will know there was a, an external um, report, uh, an assessor who came in to, to look at what we were doing and, and how we were doing things. There were um, 30 uh, recommendations that came out of that after the, the group chat incident. Of those um, 30 recommendations, 29 are being implemented at the moment, um, only one um, which has been uh, impacted by, by COVID and that's about exploring uh, what role uh, transformative justice might be able to play in all this. So what have we done? Um, we've instituted uh, new policy and processes, um, victim-led. Uh, we brought in the liaison officers uh, and the role of the liaison officer is to uh, support people who are making complaints. We have established both informal and formal routes. Sometimes people want to come forward and have an informal way of resolving, sometimes formal, the formal informal, that's not mutually exclusive. We can go down both, uh, both routes. Again, that's about being victim led. Um, what we've also instituted, again, looking through what uh, came out of group chat and looking at the um, report afterwards was a right of appeal uh, for victims in this as well. So it's, it's not just the victim gets the opportunity to make their case, they can hear what the recommendations are and then come back if they want to do more. We've built, again, as hopefully everyone knows, uh, the report and support function. Um, I know we've got a lot more work to do and you can all help us with this in terms of, of supporting this. The SU is involved in helping to, to promote this as well, make sure that people understand that what we've got here is a, a web page with everything in one place. People make contact that within a couple of days, at most, one of the liaison officers will get in touch with them to explain what their options are, to listen to them, to give advice about where they might want to go if they need additional information. We've established um, a lot of a lot of training, um, which of course is incredibly important in, in this space. We really do need to have people involved in different areas of this work with, with knowledge and experience and expertise. So at one end, we've got, um, uh, of course, the students as part of the registration, there's the values Moodle, with extensive work on sexual misconduct and consent. We've got a lot of work on active bystander training, which is students and staff. Um, again, as hopefully you will know. Um, for people in the position of uh, first reporters, there's um, training on how to receive a disclosure, critically important work, obviously. For panels uh, involved in this, um, both uh, work in terms of training on obviously our policy and our processes, but also on, uh, on definitions and on approaches. Uh, and of course, training for, for people who are involved in investigations in this area of work as well. Um, and then um, one of the other really important parts of, um, of the recommendations from the external review is that, that we needed to look again at, at the team and, and how this whole work could be put together. So we've established um, a director of student discipline post and filled it. 
we put more reserve resource into this whole area of work um, and we've also developed a pool of of specially trained um, external investigators so a lot is done but there's a lot more still to do uh, and, and i think that's a really important part of of what i want to say now let's not assume nothing's happened a lot's happened but these are foundations there's a lot of work that need to be done to, to build on this and I think one of the really important parts of this also is, is as I think I said a few moments ago, um, we just need more people to understand what's already there uh, and to be able to engage in it. But I think there are also um, allies and supporters in the student union and indeed you guys as well, who can help us get that information out and, and help us build on that platform that's in place. So um, what we can see so far is that there have been um, significant increases in the number of disclosures uh, since this new report and support process came in uh, and that's a good thing um, and what we need to do now as I say is is help build on that get advice get support from our student body as to what we need to do next thank you Stuart can we move to Raw then and your first question thank you um Warwick, unlike many other universities in lots of literature, uses the term sexual misconduct to refer to incidents of sexual harassment and assault on, instead of the word, well, phrase, sexual violence. Why is that? Why is that phrase or have Warwick seen it to be more appropriate? So, uh, again, these are the sorts of things upon which we could have a, a lot more engagement and understanding, but I think the way into this is that we see the word misconduct as being more wide ranging um, and able to be filled with more uh, aspects of behaviour that are unwanted uh, than going, as it were, purely down the violence route, which then does get you into arguments about what is and what isn't, what is structural violence and what isn't structural violence and so on. So the misconduct is there really as a signifier of, of, of attempting to think about how we address a whole series of behaviours. Um, but again, you know, it's really, it's really important that we uh, collectively talk about what kind of, of definitions and terminology. I was talking about the training part. What kind of definitions and terminology that we are we are comfortable with as a community? Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Back to uh, back to Ball. Um, so this term, we saw the university change their mind and adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. What was the reasoning why we changed the mind on this, considering last year we did not adopt the policy? So um, last year, we had a statement of where we were. And where we were was in the position, of course, of not having adopted something because it hadn't been raised. And from that period of time, there have been um, extensive engagements with, in particular, our Jewish society, who have made a whole series of, um, of, of arguments and brought a whole uh, series of pieces of evidence about how, if it is the case that we as a, as a community are uh, committed to inclusion, uh, how can that, how must that be extended to Jewish students? So after um, a, a lot of discussion and work, which I think probably, to be fair, would have moved faster if it had not been for, for COVID. Um, some of these discussions, as you all well know, they're just much easier face to face than they are in this, this sort of space. But where do we come out? We, we came out with a view that um, we were going to recognise the, the IHRA in, in the light of everything that was being said, that we were uh, adopting it um, as a way of policy um, alongside the right of freedom of speech and academic freedom. But what this would mean is that in any complaint or allegation of anti-Semitism, a disciplinary tribunal would take account of that definition. It does not mean that you would not have uh, a debate about freedom of speech as well, but alongside that, that definition would uh, would sit there. And, and what we've also done, just in terms of, you know, what do I mean by, by policy, slightly more broadly based than that, again, um, for all chairs and panel members um, hearing uh, cases around anti-Semitism, there is now uh, mandated training what anti-Semitism is and means and how it can be spoken. There are expert advisors that will be made available to advise any such panel. Um, as you all know, uh, a large number of students have um, already undertaken the revised online training on respect and discrimination, which uh, focuses on anti-Semitism. And of course, report and support, um, although we do think about it in the context that we were just discussing, also covers these spaces as well. And in a lot of this work, we have been working closely with our, with our Jewish society. 
so I think it's I think it's one of those cases where um, you know universities are um, evolving creatures, um, evolving communities, and we've evolved on this issue across the course of the year. Thanks for that question, Oliver. I think we're going back to Raw now. Is it your turn, Enoch? Yes, uh, yes. Um, following the Black Lives Matter protests this year and university efforts to decolonize in general, how will you respond to campaigns by black students such as Rename Radcliffe, um, demands for a new complaint system focused on racist incidents, and of course, the adoption of a formal definition of racism? So um, thank you. Uh, all, all of those issues, as you well know, are under debate at the moment. It's, it's, it's great, actually, to have that question on the back of the previous question, um, because, as I say, you know, universities are evolving uh, and emerging uh, communities in different sorts of ways. Um, we have got at the moment a lot of discussions, as you, you'll know, I hope anyway, that Race Equality Task Force is working in this sort of space. A lot of other debates and discussions are going on. There, there, are, there are slightly different things, as you've just put, set out the question. There are slightly different tracks uh, across all this space, but we are looking to listen, um, to engage uh, and look to respond, probably at different speeds because those are different sets of tracks. There are different sets of issues ongoing, but I understand the point of putting them all together in terms of how we as a university do um, not only respond to, to Black Lives Matter, but, but that that whole movement becomes something that is part of the mainstream of the university and not something which is, what would you say, I don't know, kind of bookmarked as, as a 2020 thing. It's got to be part of what we are as an institution uh, uh, moving into the next year and beyond. What, what we see is um, growing numbers uh, of black students um, in the university, and that's a great and welcome thing. Um, and it means there will be more voices um, across the university that we can listen to engage with as well. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Stuart. So uh, we go back to, uh, I think it's Nicole and uh, from the board. Thank you. Um, students from Hong Kong have spoken out to us that they're still being targeted and intimidated by other Warwick students that are part of the Chinese Students and Scholars Association. So what is Warwick doing to protect these students? So all students uh, from whatever part of the world with whatever characteristics that they feel are being uh, challenged or threatened, please, please, please report. Please, please, please report. We can only do things once we have got evidence. And, and, and again, going back to the, the very first question you asked, it is report and support. So we'll be looking to support students who have made sets of, of complaints. Complaints need support, complaints need evidence, and they will then be, they will then be investigated. Um, there's a huge amount, as you guys do in media work, as, as you know, there's a huge amount of noise on social media about all sorts of things going on at the moment. It's only when those things come from social media noise into specific complaints that we can easily act uh, upon these things. Well, maybe not easily, but at least we can try to act upon these sorts of things. So I would encourage, please, all students who feel that they have those sorts of challenges in their lives across the spectrum again, please bring those issues forward. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Stuart. So back to uh, to Lucy from Raw. So another big part of life at Warwick is where you live and who you live with, uh, especially as you move into your second and third years. And a lot of students are reliant on Warwick accommodation as a part of that for finding uh, accommodation for their later years in study where they feel as though they won't, they will be safe, they have a trusted landlord. So why has the university decided to cancel um, off-campus Warwick accommodation? And is there going to be anything to replace it? So um, let me just go back into your question, um, because there are lots of pieces there which are quite right. So we are considering this move at the moment. And the reason we're considering this move at the moment is when um, we started this service, the accommodation, relatively poor quality accommodation out there. So we established um, this service to try to both help students find accommodation and also work to drive up the quality of the accommodation. In the last few years, um, again, as you'll probably know, the amount of um, private accommodation for students has increased by extraordinary amounts. And um, it is now the case that there is quite a lot of empty private accommodation 
um, across um, particular Coventry uh, that is not filled by students from either Warwick University or from Coventry University. So the, the market situation has changed um, and partly we're recognising that. The other thing is that since well, the last few years anyway, um, and again, with a lot of help and engagement support from Student Union, um, we're, we are, I think, collectively much more engaged with our local authorities in terms of the support for driving up the quality of accommodation and for calling out landlords, frankly, whose behaviour is not really satisfactory, if I can put it in diplomatic speak. So again, things have changed um, uh, in that space as well. So what we're, what we're thinking about um, at the moment is uh, moving towards a, an advertise-only scheme. So there would still be something there for students. Students would still be, have a, a docking place, as it were, in Warwick accommodation to understand where there are uh, private sector accommodation opportunities uh, and what kind of work is going on with the local authorities around that, if there are any kind of issues. So that will still be there. We'll still be a docking place for students. That's what we're looking at at the moment. But because of the change in the other two pieces, essentially we're looking at um, a means of changing the effectively the kind of mode of delivery of service to students. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, I think we're back to Oliver now from the board. Yeah, obviously, as we spoke about before, uh, 2020 has been an incredible difficult year for everyone, um, with many students unable to pay their rent because of loss of revenue from various uh, aspects. Um, in light of this, uh, will the university consider forgiving the students who took part in the rent strike in summer? So that's not our policy. Um, we have um, a, a clear uh, policy, I hope, in terms of hardship funding support. Um, and we do have significant numbers of students who are applying for, uh, for hardship funding and have since the, um, the pandemic started. Um, our view is that is the appropriate way of looking to support students in the challenging circumstances that you have just described in, in your question, um, rather than to go down the road of as you put it, forgiving uh, debt for, for rent strike. So if where we have students who have the kind of financial challenges that you're describing, please, please, please encourage them to come forward uh, for the different hardship funding routes that we have got. Um, we have at the moment something in the order of a quarter of a million pounds um, that has been um, allocated through different hardship routes. Um, and we will keep supporting those uh, students who come forward now and across the winter and into the future. Thank you. Uh, Enoch from Raw. Yeah, sort of touching on Ollie's point there. Um, this has been a very difficult year, and in fact, this, this term has been a very difficult term. Um, given the lack of extracurricular activities and reduced opportunities for socialising due to COVID, do you believe that this year's first years received the same quality of university experience as previous years? It's a different quality of experience. I couldn't possibly say it's the same quality of experience um, for all the reasons that, that you've, uh, you've set out. Um, what um, we've had to do is, of course, follow the government guidelines. And there are um, two sets of government guidelines, uh, one about the education uh, and one about social interaction. So on education, the Department for Education um, has set out four tiers of, of operation. And the, the tier one, as it were, is uh, to have blended learning um, as much as is possible up to around 50-50. And we have stayed with that tier one as long as we possibly could this uh, term. And we intend to do so next term. Tier two is where you reduce the face-to-face -face quite radically back. Tier three is where you only have laboratory uh, work, class work, face to face, everything else is online, and, and tier four is where everything is online. Um, as you will well know, and will have seen around the country, and will know from, from friends and family, many universities have had to go down that DFE set of tiers through two uh, and through three quite a long way. Uh, there are students who have had no opportunity to have any face to face teaching at all uh, in other universities, not in our university we have committed ourselves to be at tier one. Now, you're asking about the second set of tiers, which of course are the tiers that have been brought in across different regions, and what it is that we can and can't do in terms of social distancing because of that. Our argument has been um, that certainly for Warwickshire, but actually also for Coventry, we should not now be sitting in tier three. The data does not support it. We should be sitting in tier two. Tier two gives us more opportunity, again, as you well know, for the kind of um, extra work 
extracurricular work, it's not work, fun, um, that students want to have uh, in their terms here. So uh, we are making those arguments, looking from the lessons of this term, where certainly things have been more restrictive on a regional and national level than we expected. What we are planning for next term is, under the heading of Warwick Presents is a whole series of, of, of focused activities so that students will be able to engage much more with each other. We've just had results from our student survey for this first term and where we can see some very positive responses for blended learning where there is significant face to face. Of course, students are telling us there's not enough social interaction, but we are constrained. We are constrained by what it is that we must do um, in terms of government restrictions. We're also constrained, of course, because of the rules and regulations around self-isolation. Um, and, and I think if there's one thing um, that has been perhaps the most painful um, across the space that you're talking about for this term is the significant number of students who have had to self-isolate. Um, and that's been obviously very, very, very difficult for students who've done this. And I have to say here um, that the way in which students engage with that sound of isolation was fantastic. Whereas the media likes, not you, the mainstream media likes to portray students as, you know, troubles and problem makers and all the rest of it. Uh, we have seen students really fantastically engage with those really onerous restrictions of, of self-isolation. But it has made things more difficult. We are working on the basis that with asymptomatic testing on return, if students, please help us with this as, as um, media, please help us encourage students, please to come back, get those asymptomatic tests. And that will give us the opportunity, I think, for far more um, engagement across the piece. Thank you. Nicole, your next question, please. Thank you. Um, given that students miss a lot of teaching last academic year from strike action and during term three, and now with students experiencing online teaching, will students ever see reimbursement for the teaching they've missed? So um, two answers to that. Um, obviously, where individual students have particular circumstances and particular complaints they want to raise, uh, they again should do so. It is their right. It is their right to do so. If, however, you are asking the second question, which is, are we going to make a, an across the board um, rebate of fees? We are not. And we are not because we believe that we have delivered the uh, learning outcomes that we committed to deliver. And in particular, across term three, fair comment to raise term three, we delivered the um, assessment and engagement outcomes uh, that were appropriate to the level of uh, the student that was studying. So we are not planning on um, what sometimes is called um, responding to kind of a class action, um, but obviously where there are students who have particular issues, um, they should raise those through the normal complaints process. Thank you, Nicole. Lucy from Raw. Thank you. Um, so obviously Brexit is causing, a, again, even more, we discussed this last year, but even more uncertainty for the university. And um, I can see you holding your head in your hands. Um, what are the university doing to sort of mitigate the effects for EU students? And another thing, are you planning on raising fees um, for these students as a result of us leaving the EU at the end of this year? So unfortunately, we are required to raise fees for new students arriving from the EU um, uh, in the future in the way that you described. The, the, there is no longer going to be a category um, for students from Europe, which allows them to have a fee status nationally. This is not just Warwick, nationally, um, alongside home students. So uh, EU student fees will rise to international fee levels because by definition in Brexit, um, Europe is international, not, not local. Um, I have I have a few views on this, but maybe this is not the moment to share um, to share those. Um, what we have done is we are establishing a global scholarship scheme. It is a global scheme, um, but uh, uh, clearly it will give opportunity for European students as well to apply with certain sets of criteria to have reductions in those um, international fee levels. So that's one of the things that we'll do. I think to go back to your first question. Um, so I'm really worried at the moment. You know, we are days away from not only the worst case, but the absolute worst case of uh, of a no deal Brexit. Um, and, you know, uh, 
already been reading today what you'd expect, um, which is people saying, well, obviously, you know, because of recognition, mutual recognition of COVID restrictions will end on the 31st of December. It may be the case that people going from Britain into the European Union will have their travel restricted. And if, if please let cool wise heads prevail, but if that happens, what happens if there is then retaliation on the British side as well? What I'm really worried about is when I say the absolute worst case is, is not just no deal, um, but a whole series of escalating countermeasures uh, one side uh, against another. It's moving really fast. It's really quite difficult to um, have a very clear statement today, unfortunately. I really wish we weren't having to have this uh, conversation, uh, but what I can promise you is that as things emerge, if they do have short term impacts uh, upon our students, um, we will be sharing that information with you and we will be seeking to, well, at the very least, mitigate the impacts of those. Thanks, Lucy. Oliver, your next question, please. Um, so obviously we talked about how the pandemic has affected a lot of uh, elements, but how has it affected the university's plans to create a campus with net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2030? And if there is a delay, when will that be communicated to students? Uh, there is no delay. Thank you so much for asking that question. It's vitally, vitally, vitally important. We'll be bringing forward, um, actually in early January, we've we're looking at the final kind of sets of proposals on Monday um, on the environmental and social sustainability strategy. This is, of course, um, the work that comes out of the declaration of the climate emergency. Uh, and it is premised exactly as you say on, on where uh, can we decarbonize quickly to hit that 2030 route. Um, uh, I think the question that you ask is, is probably a fair one in some ways globally. Um, I'm, I'm personally not quite sure where um, the climate change agenda is. I'm, 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 I'm hoping, if I'm allowed to say this, that um, uh, after the inauguration of a new president in the United States, um, things might be slightly clearer in a positive uh, direction. Um, but, you know, I think there's a huge amount of work that the world has got to do. We are framing a whole series of things, working with students, again, I hope you know this, working with students, working with a whole variety of staff, that does two things. One, it talks about what we do on our campus, and two, it talks about where there might be things on our campus, pieces of knowledge, learning, whatever, that are transferable to others and vice versa, where there are things we can learn elsewhere to, to, to come here. We have um, um, a, 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 a quite a bit of land in Warwick District. Uh, quite a lot of that land at the moment is, is rented out for farmland. Um, one of the things I hope we're going to be discussing next year is, is how we can turn that much more into um, a park area with more diversity, with also uh, the possibility of generating green energy in some of those parts of the land as well, so that this can become, you know, a, a bit of a lung, really, not just actually for the university, but for, for the city um, and for our region. We're working towards COP26. Uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to take a whole series of things there as well. Uh, it will be, I hope, um, a really intense exchange of ideas um, and a really intense exchange of practices because we do need to start moving from ideas into practices, uh, again, as your question uh, indicated. Um, but from January, we'll start rolling out what that strategy looks like, how it needs to be built, where we can find um, quicker ways forward. Through our Estates Committee, we've also already done quite a lot of work in, in looking to see um, where there are quick wins on decarbonisation. Um, and there are some, well, quick is probably not really the right the right word, but um, nearer term answers on decarbonisation. We've still got a big chunk that we that is going to be very hard to find a plan for, but for which we have to find a plan. So we need to be identifying that and bringing that for discussion as well about the sorts of things that we can do. It's going to affect um, our buildings, it's going to affect our behaviour. Um, and of course, that's the crucial piece. Uh, it's always very easy, isn't it, to talk about materials. It's always much more difficult to talk about behaviours. Lovely. Enoch, it's your turn again now. Yeah. Um, parking fees on campus have been increased, have increased considerably to pay for an innovative new transport system on campus. Are there any specifics you can offer us on what this may be? So we have, um, um, I mean, again, actually, it's, it's a great question to backing on to the last question, um, because clearly if we're going to be as a, as a, as a community um, serious about decarbonisation, um, we have got to have fewer petrol driven vehicles um, coming on to campus 
with one person in them. So we need to have a whole series of things um, uh, uh, developed as we're going forward. So, so one thing is around electric. Um, again, I hope you know that uh, this is a university which is really at the forefront of developing batteries for vehicles in the first instance, but, but those batteries then have second and third life uh, as a wider process of green electrification goes across the country, hopefully. Uh, secondly, we of course um, have uh, a, a lot of plans about how we will engage with uh, the really important government commitment um, about effectively the abolition, ab abolition of the internal combustion engine by 2030. If, if that's going to happen, then of course petrol driven cars are going to start to be driven out from new sale, probably in three, four, five years time. You know, the sort of work that's going on in Warwick Manufacturing Group and the School of Engineering elsewhere is really critical to, to what that means for car companies, car companies have got all the interests now, hopefully, to move forward into that uh, into that area. One of the big things we're working for as a university with our local stakeholders is the creation of a gigafactory. This would be the first one in the country. It would be purely about um, a large scale producing those batteries, first for cars, then for, for wider use. I cannot emphasize too much how critically important this is. This is the way we don't just get to that D, um, uh, the, the end of the internal combustion engine by 2030, but we get there faster um, because it will be in the market interests of car companies to get to that place faster. We already uh, are partly running the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre. That's a critical part of it. The other thing I just want to share with you is um, uh, one of the things we're working on really hard. Again, it's, it's technology being developed in this university is a very light rail system. I am personally a passionate believer in very light rail systems, metro systems, but but light, not really heavy. So if you've been on the one across Birmingham and Wolverhampton, that's a, a heavy uh, metro system, which means you have to dig up the ground in order to put the rails in. This technology lies on top of the road effectively, which makes it hopefully about one seventh the price, which means you get seven miles more than for every mile you get for the heavy one, which means you can run it out way more quickly. We're driving that. There is um, a plan that is uh, run by Coventry City Council, endorsed by the West Midlands Combined Authority, funded by government to take the pilot scheme, which is actually running on a track in Dudley, uh, and to bring it to develop it across our region. And, and our university should be the first beneficiary of that, taking us from, from our campus through to um, Coventry Rail Station uh, and across to uh, the hospital in the first instance, but there's still plenty of politics around that. Finally, um, we're working incredibly hard on, on a, um, if I can use this phrase, a heavy rail station. So a University of Warwick station that would go, would sit between Kenilworth um, and Coventry. Uh, will enable students from Leamington to have the opportunity to come up there, to come off and to come onto a non-petrol option to bring students from that rail station across onto campus. So, so, so actually across the transport space, um, there's a lot of ambition there um, that there has to be, because actually if we don't do that, we can't hit our decarbonisation targets. Um, but also if we do it right, it gives fantastic opportunities, I hope, for um, our students to have more choice about how they travel around, but also fantastic opportunities for lots of the brilliant research going on uh, within the university. That's great. Thank you, Enoch. Nicole? I'm turning to coronavirus cases that were recorded during term one. So when students arrived at universities across the country, many were blamed for the rise in cases and lo in local outbreaks. But the highest number of active cases that was recorded at Warwick was 216 at any one time. So how did the university keep case numbers low compared to other universities across the country that experienced thousands of cases? What did Warwick do differently? I think it's what students did differently. Um, I, I think it's an answer I gave earlier. We, we had um, students being just fantastically, fantastically responsible. That does not mean, of course, that people who caught coronavirus were acting irresponsibly because we know how easy it is to catch. You can be just, just unlucky. You can be just not paying attention for a moment. We know that is the case. But, uh, but students across the place were absolutely fantastic. Um, I suppose to help that, um, it was really important that we had our own test and trace facility. Uh, that, that I think was really important. Uh, it became clear, forgive me, I forget the months, I'm going to say probably in July, um, that the government test and trace system was not going to be available. 
um, for this part of the world uh, in time. Um, so we got our test and trace up and running on the 1st of September. Um, the, the, um, the, the government, the test and trace uh, facility, as you know, wasn't up, in, up and running by campus um, until the end of October and in Leamington at the, um, at the same time. So I think having that as well, so that when people were showing symptoms, they were able to get some, some diagnosis fairly, fairly quickly. The, the third thing is, I, was, I, I do think that, um, you know, the, um, the, the kind of um, demographics, um, the geography, if you like, the human geography of uh, the coronavirus is, is, is very interesting to, to kind of understand. And there's a hugely important research project in there as well. You know, why is it um, that Coventry, for example, as a city, had much lower rates than cities in the north of England with pretty similar human geography and, and, and demographics. Why, why is that? that? That's a really important question, which I don't know the answer to. And I think um, at some stage in the future, I'm sure we'll have a great piece of research that will enable us to, to understand that. But I think it was that partnership, particularly with the city as well, by, by partnership, I mean the citizens of the city as well, that kept those infection rates down, uh, down so much. And it's one of the reasons why sitting in tier three now is so hard to take because people have worked, people across the city have worked so hard to keep businesses going, to keep infection rates going low, and yet to be tumped into to tier three now, not quite as painful as it is for people in Warwickshire perhaps, who have seen you know, the gap between their infection rates um, and infection rates elsewhere really, really wide. Um, but we really do need to come out of these tier three restrictions quickly as the infection rates go down. Thanks, Nicole. Back to Lucy. Thank you. Um, so last year we asked you what the university was doing with the um, wellbeing resources and what it was doing to cope with the increasing population uh, on campus and what uh, the university was doing to increase these resources and make them more accessible and available for students. So what is the university again doing this year in wake of, in wake of that, but also the pandemic? Because obviously there has a, been a significant surge in demand for wellbeing resources at the university. Yeah, fair, absolutely, fair, absolutely fair question. Um, so uh, we've increased the number of, uh, of staff uh, in uh, wellbeing support services, uh, over 40 now. Um, we now increased the budget to uh, somewhere around two and a half million um, uh, as we've developed um, those services over the course of the year. Um, as you quite rightly say, the, the level of demand for um, support has increased in the university and indeed across the country, quite rightly, as you say, quite significantly um, in some parts of the country, there's sort of fourfold increase. Um, you may not know that uh, we, alongside other universities in, in Universities UK, have been talking to government um, about whether there's sufficient um, appetite in government to provide some um, relatively short term financial additional support. Um, as you'll know, all universities are in a more embarrassed position financially this year um, than they have been in previous years. Um, is there an opportunity for government to support us here? Signs aren't great, um, but that's one of the, uh, the avenues that we're looking at. Um, people are working. You will know this. I know uh, people who are uh, readers of the BOR and uh, viewers of RAW. Uh, you'll know that the uh, wellbeing support services staff are working fantastically hard to do as much as they as much as they possibly can. Um, but there is always the danger of of, of that bit of, of catch up. If we think forward into next year, um, what I'm hopeful of is that we can be slightly more optimistic about the way in which we will be living our lives as a community next year, um, perhaps after January uh, through February and March, and hopefully um, that some of that extreme uh, demand will uh, will tail off a little. Um, but we it would be it would be incredibly important if government would provide that additional support at this moment in time. I think I would be um, able to say that, um, although I know colleagues won't like me saying this, um, we're able to handle the demand at the moment. Um, but as you say, there's tremendous pressure everywhere. Thank you. Oliver, please. Uh, why did Warwick as a university announce their plans for a blended learning approach quite late into the summer holidays, especially when compared to other universities, meaning that students had less time to prepare for the year when it came to travel and accommodation arrangements? So I'm, I'm not aware that we were significantly late as in everyone else had moved before us. 
um, there was a whole, there was a kind of a phase, wasn't there, where people were declaring in different periods of time. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to declare what we would actually do with the maximum amount of face to face. And, and what that required was a huge amount of work in all of our teaching buildings to calculate really accurately with all the social distancing exactly what was possible and then to feed that into timetables to make that work. So really our commitment was to, to do what we said we were going to do and that just took us that bit of time to make sure we were in the right place. As I say, I'm, I'm, I wasn't I wasn't particularly aware that we were radically later compared to, to, to others, but I do take the point that it made for, for some students, um, some questions about what it was they were going to do and how were they going to, to travel back. I hope that we were clear from the beginning, however, that it was our ambition to start on campus and on time. I heard that message was heard very early, even if the detail of people's timetables were developed rather later. Thank you. Enoch. Um, in May, the university announced that the sessional teaching budget would be cut by at least 50% as part of a 50 million savings target. Uh, many casual teachers, casual tutors and PhD students rely on the sessional teaching budget. And work anti capitalization claimed that if each of the 183 staff earning above 100,000 per annum agreed to cap their income at 90,000, the sessional teaching budget would not be cut at all. Have you explored alternative ways to address the university's financial shortfall caused by pandemic? So um, the uh, if you want to use the word shortfall in the budget for sessional teachers who are now graduate teaching assistants and members of staff is significantly less than that now. Um, we have gone through a process of firstly um, moving away from a casualized model into a graduate teaching assistant model, which as I say is employed. Um, and secondly, where we have seen significant numbers um, of students come to this university creating the demand for teaching we have filled those places with graduate teaching assistants. So we believe that what we have got now is a, a teaching force, workforce, which is appropriate to the number of students that we have. Thank you. Nicole, do you have another question for us? Yes. Um, so over the past four years, Warwick's teaching staff have gone on strike three times over the issue of pensions. Students want to know why can't you reach an agreement on this issue? Um, so um, we have a national pension scheme for um, uh, academic staff and some professional staff, which is run by the university's uh, superannuation scheme. Uh, all universities are required to be members of this. There is no option to withdraw from it. Universities as employers are represented in this by Universities UK. Um, if you look back at the history of the 2018 dispute, you might find that this university sat in a very different place to where the rest of the employers sat. The fundamental challenge, of course, is that uh, all pension schemes are the most capitalist part of our economy. Pension schemes uh, survive and prosper on the stock market. And as the stock market changes, then the value of pension schemes changes with it. We are now going through a new valuation process. Um, next year will be a period of great difficulty in getting an agreement between employers on the one hand and the pension scheme on the other, and also between employers and the trade union on what the best way forward uh, should be. It is not a simple calculation, I'm afraid, um, as to how we might resolve this. Some of the initial, and I emphasize please the word initial, indications from the um, pension uh, company is that uh, to maintain where we are at the moment costs could rise to 50 percent of an individual's wages it's extraordinary level so and which institutions can't uh, can't make and indeed individuals making their own contributions would not be able to make so we need to try to work together and find a more creative way of solving this really difficult issue. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, we're back now to Lucy again. Thank you. Um, when will the university release details about the CCFC stadium plans? And will students, as obviously key stakeholders, uh, be consulted on this big new development? 
Uh, so the second part is yes, um, absolutely. Um, on the first part, so what we have to establish is um, what is the framework agreement that could be reached between the university and the football club? That's the first part. What kind of, within which we have to say what it is that we would be prepared to accept in very broad terms. Once we have that, then we'll be able to talk with uh, students and other stakeholders about what does that look like. I'm hopeful that we'll be in a position to do that next term. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why that might not happen because of lawyers and you know viruses and all the rest of it. But the plan is to have something around which we can have a consultation next uh, next term. I suspect no matter how interested uh, students are in this, that student interest will be massively dwarfed by the interest of the supporters of County City Football Club. So um, also um, we're going to need to make sure that when we do this work, of course students need to be involved, but we are open for that much wider, much larger probably number of engaged people across the city and beyond. Thank you. Oliver. Uh, obviously in light of this year being incredibly stressful, as I'm sure, especially in your position, it has been very stressful. Uh, do you still see yourself being a vice chancellor in five years time? And adding on to that, what is your desired legacy from the position? <laughs> do you know how often that question comes up? You know, are, are you going to stick it out longer? It's, it's, it's a great question. Um, I do actually see myself going through the, the, the next five years. I think what we are I think what we're embarking on, and by by we, I'm, I'm hopefully saying we, the community, um, is really a process of of change and evolution um, in a number of different domains. Um, I, I am really hopeful that collectively, on the question you asked earlier, in terms of decarbonisation and, and and climate change, we'll, we'll make really radical moves in the next five years. I'm hoping that in terms of the questions that we started with around inclusion and diversity. We are a radically different institution in, in five years time. Um, I'm not necessarily saying five years, not six years. I hope you, you understand me saying yeah. that. But, but those, are, those are the spaces where I think that we really can as a, as a community, par partly because of where we are in Coventry and Warwickshire, I think we can make some really, really big moves. Thanks, Oliver. So we've got, we'll have another question from Enoch and then we'll do one more round and then I think we'll be out of time. So um, Enoch next and then we'll we'll do uh, four more questions. Yeah, I think Oliver asked about the future, so I'll ask about the past. Um, looking back now, um, is there anything you would do differently or anything you regret that you've um, happened during your tenure so far? I mean, you know, uh, yeah, there's... Um, there's lots of stuff and now you're going to want me to try and pick on something aren't you pick pick one um pick one out um um can i do a terrible thing and kind of think about it and get back to you and and and, and you know to be absolutely honest the reason is i mean you know oliver kind of asked it i feel completely cream crackered i really do feel completely wiped out at this moment in time i can barely remember my name so i, I want to give you a really sensible and decent answer to that you deserve a decent answer to that because um, you've asked me, you know, what is the one thing, you know, that I would have done different? Um, so can I please come back to you about that? Think I, about that. I will, come I will you. hold you to that. I will yes, hold you to that. Yeah, I'll come, come. I, 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 I do tend to do what I say I do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one more question each. So we're back to Nicole. Um, is there a potent the potential for another safety net this year, given the disruption students have experienced because of the pandemic? Um, so clearly the answer must be yes, if you ask the, the question as you did in terms of the possibility, clearly the question must be answered with a yes. But of course, we absolutely have to see what happens over the course of the next period of period of time. So we're not at a decision point yet. And that, of course, cuts cuts both ways. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Lucy. Thank you. Um, would you say that uh, as a whole, obviously, the university has had to adapt uh, basically on a daily basis to the evolving coronavirus situation? Would you say that the university as a whole has done that? Uh, well, I use this word probably quite broadly and um, competently and as quickly and as timely as the situation unfolds. 
Uh, well, I, I'm absolutely sure that, you know, as we look back on this, we'll say, I oh, wish we'd done that and wish we'd moved to this point and, and all, the, all those sorts of things, because exactly as you say, things have moved so fast. Um, but, you know, we, we're sitting on some, some indications at the moment uh, in terms of that um, uh, term one survey work, which, which is saying that, you know, um, students who have answered that are saying that those who have had higher levels of face-to-face -face, uh, teaching in terms of the blended learning approach. You know, 82% are saying that they are rating what they've had in their education as, as, as good or very good. And, and I think that's, that's, that's not me, I haven't done that. Um, that's colleagues working with students all around the institution who've done an absolutely brilliant job. So, so, so that is fantastic, I think. If we just flick back a little bit to the summer, um, the way in which everyone rose to the challenge of new assessment methods for, for the end of year was a, was a fantastic thing as well. I think that was great. Um, so I think we have. I mean, I, I gave this kind of analogy to somebody the other day that it, it, it kind of feels people across the institution have done so many great things, but it's just to get score draws because the next day something else comes quite often from government, I have to say, quite often from government. Um, that means you've got to do something all over again. Uh, sorry, you lost me. I'm, I'm back. You're Did, back. You you're, you're back. We much, lost you for. Uh, how much of? Uh, how often does that happen to everybody? Eh? How often does <laughs> that happen over the course of six months? Ah, it's just gone down. I think. I think basically what I'm trying to say is that people worked incredibly hard. There are lessons that we need to learn because not only because you know it's important to know what we've done, but also the stuff that's happened now that actually we're going to want to keep doing. So let's make sure we choose the right stuff and not the wrong stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Oliver? Um, so obviously during the height of the first lockdown, we had to see graduation ceremonies be cancelled. Um, obviously that's one of the highlights of a university career. It's a big celebration at the end for all the hard work you've put in. What are the plans for those students that weren't able to have a full graduation? And can we see a full graduation for students due to graduate this year? So I desperately hope we can see uh, a full graduation for students this year. I mean, goodness me, let's have some some optimistic things to look forward to, for goodness sake. Um, it's obviously going to depend on, on on social distancing regulations. And, you know, Patrick Valance was not my favourite person yesterday. I don't know if you heard when he said, oh, we'll all be wearing masks and doing social distancing next winter. Um, really? Um, let's assume we're not in that world. Let's assume that we can have our graduation ceremonies. That would be great. Gets us moving. Now, we've got a number of students, as you quite rightly say, who are no longer students. They have graduated, they have their certificates, they've moved on. But we want to have a celebration. We want to find a way of bringing those students back this summer, if we can, into a place where we can do something where people can dress up um, if they want to. We can do something which is a kind of uh, a, a focus ceremony or something. Plenty of chance for, for, for pitches, but opportunities for, for groups of students to come back and have a party. Um, and and I, when all this started, I did promise everybody on the institution a party. And and this summer, this has got to be the time where we all have it. <laughs> Thank you. And finally, Enoch. Um, well, you, you just you've um, I had you just managed to undercut my final question there um, very brilliantly. So I'll give you credit for that. So I'll I'll, I'll build on it then. I'll, I'll start asking for some specific details. Um, Students want to know, will Disco Day be DJing at this one hell of a party? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, probably. <laughs> probably. Can I say one last thing? Because I know we're almost out of time. Thank, thank you all so much. I just want to say one, one last appeal, if I may, um, because you were all in um, really important positions of influence by virtue of the role that you're doing in terms of student media. It goes back to something I was saying right at the beginning. Please encourage, we'll be doing the same students those students who are going to come back we have many who will be staying on campus um we have some of course who have already left we have some who have not yet joined us but those coming in january please come get asymptomatic tests please 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 it's really 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 important not painful and difficult all run by our brilliant uh, medical school students um and uh, you know really successful operations so come back and that will really help us have a test before you go into a class it's not quite a phrase, is it? But, you know, I'm sure you can work with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for 24 brilliant questions. Thank you for your responses, Stuart. And uh, just uh, wish everybody um, uh, a happy, safe vacation. Yeah. Thank, you. Great, thank, you. thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Across campus, online, and on 12.51am. This, this, this is your student radio station.